If we understood scripture, we wouldn't even have any of that language in our mouth. Like, when you talk like that, you actually reveal that you don't understand scripture. Because how can I reckon myself dead indeed to sin and keep talking about my ability to commit it? What I'm not doing is I'm not letting righteousness rest on me. I'm not letting it have its perfect effect. And I'm not understanding what the finished work accomplishes and how grace works. Because in myself, I will never stop sinning. I could never change. My heart will stay wicked. But I got a new heart. I got new life. I got a new heart. Are you following me? If I got a renewed mind and I'm transformed, watch the scripture in Galatians 5. If I live by the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So what do you do with that scripture? If I continue to live in the Spirit, I continue to have that result. But Christians don't believe that because our own life testimony proves otherwise. And we think that it's humble to always talk about our ability to sin instead of deceived. So the only thing I can do is get out of living in the spirit. Take something personal, not renew my mind, not spend intimate personal time and get exchanges with God and put off and put on. All of a sudden I realize that if I fulfill the lust of the flesh, it's because I'm stepping out of walking in the spirit, which is simply walking in truth. People don't talk about this stuff. I've never heard a preacher even talk about this. I have one friend that talked about this boldly one time. In fact, I was just with him and I said, nobody talked about this. He said, oh, I did. I talked about it boldly. And he, he brought it up on the internet. I watched it on YouTube. I said, you did talk about it. I said, bravo. Old Testament, Garden of Eden times. You got Cain, you got Abel, you got sacrifices, you got a brother that's disgruntled. You got God coming to that brother saying, why is your countenance falling? Why are you looking like you're looking? Why are you acting like you're acting? God knows what's coming down, right? He's trying to intercept him. This is what he said to Cain. Cain, Old Testament. No cross, no Jesus, no person of Holy Spirit living inside of him. He said this to Cain and there's no way around it. He said, it's just sin. It's crouching at your doorstep and its desire is for you. And you should master over it. Nobody preaches that. That's God talking. Nobody preaches that. We just preach our experience and we all say, well, we got this dual nature. Well, I don't know about you, but I have a new heart. The night I got saved, I didn't like my wife. We were getting divorced and I was celebrating. I had my eyes on a girl eight years younger and I'd have made some bad mistakes if God didn't intervene. And I wasn't even thinking about my wife. I didn't go to God because I was broken because my marriage was over. God came to me. And on the day, the night I got saved, if you'd asked me about my wife, I would have told you all the things that I had hang-ups about my wife and all the excuses and all the judgments towards her. 30 minutes after I got saved, didn't read my Bible, nobody prayed for me. It was just me and God alone in an aisle way at work. 30 minutes after I got saved, I thought about my wife and saw a whole different woman. I saw a woman that cared, that was super patient, that I exasperated, that I never loved, that I always complained towards and never showed appreciation towards. I felt totally broken that I mistreated her and I felt like she was an amazing lady. If one minute before the encounter with God, I would have told you she's da 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 and believed it. A half hour after the encounter with God, I had a whole different view. Why? Love came into me. I was changed on the inside. His life came in, started looking through my eyeballs. You know what was good? I didn't pray to go to heaven. Nothing about the encounter had anything to do with what I was getting from God. 
Everything about the encounter had to do with me never living another day, the wretch that I saw I was, the self-centered bum that I saw I was, and living everything he created me to be. That was my goal. The reason I went to God wasn't that in case I died, I made heaven. It was while I live that I live for purpose and walk in truth. And because that's my motive, that's what I've gone after all this time. Am I going to live forever? I believe it. I'm one with the eternal one and nobody can snatch me from his hand. Sounds like a given. Do I appreciate it? Yeah, but I'll tell you what I really appreciate, knowing him. Because knowing him is the transformation of your life. Knowing about him convicts you. Knowing him changes you. Most people stop with knowing about him and they pursue scriptural knowledge. And then they become puffed up and right. I've known people that know this Bible. They cut you off and finish what you're about to say. And they're mean. And nobody even wants to be around them. And they use the Bible like a baseball bat. Proving they don't even know the one they're talking about. We're supposed to be gentle with all. Serving the Lord should be gentle with all. Not argumentative. If perhaps God could bring repentance to the situation. We're supposed to not grow weary and well-doing. Above all, as much as depends on you, be at peace with all men. As much as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Blessed are the, not the issue driven. Blessed are the, not the issue driven. Peacemakers. Let's go. We got to get, we got to deal with this sin thing. I've never preached in my life. And people even say, was it possible to live without sin? Because scripture says it's possible to live without sin. Dan says it's impossible to live without sin. I'm just telling you, if I live by the spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The topic isn't even, I think that just throws everybody off when we make that the topic. It's not, is it possible to live without sin? Is it possible to live in right standing with God? See, that's what we're missing. And here's what we don't understand. That when I do live in right standing with God, it empowers me to live from, free from sin like I've never experienced, without even trying. Because who he is and his love has such a draw on me and his goodness has led me to the change of mind, to repentance. Like, I don't want to interrupt this. I don't want to do anything. I heard a preacher say one time, I think it was Bill Johnson, what would I do with sin? It's like having a third shoe. But people don't understand that preaching because they think sin is our identity. Sin should be like a third shoe. What am I going to do with that? What do I want with that? See, there's things that were in my heart that I couldn't get out of my heart that when I got saved, I couldn't even remember they were in my heart. Like I couldn't even relate to the fact that they were in my heart because I changed. Are you with me? I heard a man one time, he said... You know, I used to drink and curse like a sailor and drink and run around and party. He said, man, when I got saved, I didn't try to stop drinking and curse. I just didn't anymore. And I went, oh, I like that because I get that. My coworkers used to freak out about that. They said, you don't even swear anymore. I'm like, did you notice I don't catch myself or cut myself off or try not to? It's just not in me. And I took the whole lunchtime to tell my coworkers what new life in Christ was. And they were like, whoa, we shouldn't have asked this question. <laughs> no, they got touched. My co I had so much fun at work. I used to hate going to work. You know the old story, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde? Well, I used to be Hyde in my life. And then when I'd go to work, I was worse than Hyde. So I wasn't ever Jekyll and Hyde. I was Hyde and Hyde. I was hiding a worse hide because I'd go to work and I'd get even worse because I hated it, grindstone, didn't want to be there, 
my whole life going to have to work and do this job and throw cases just to make a living. And I'm just like a lot of people, grumbly and mean and angry and frustrated and feeling like the company owes me because I showed up. Oh, it was so bad. Once I got saved, appreciated my job, honored the people at my job, wanted to do my work under God, and I couldn't wait to get to work. I went from resenting work to couldn't wait to get to work because I realized my whole life is a living epistle and I'm here to be an example and represent something I say I believe. I know tons of Christians that resent work. They don't have a revelation that their work field is their mission field, that they're missionaries and they don't even realize it. Their work is where they should be sowing seeds because they spend so much time there. Their attitude matters. You say, well, I blew it. You only blew it if you don't find change. And if you find change and you start living different, they'll throw up the way you've lived in your face for the first however long, but in time, they'll forget how you live because how you're living is right in front of them. Like your, your testimony in your life is huge. Like what you manifest, what you portray, what people see when they see you, people that get to hang around you for a long time, and then they say, what do you think of so-and-so? I mean, there's something without us trying so hard and always preaching or handing out a track or evangelism that they should see about us that's attractive in the sense that their heart's convicted. My one coworker said, when I got, I was four days saved, four days. Like, what can you do in four days? I didn't even mention Jesus. And they sent a guy in the bathroom and everybody stayed away from the wash sink. If you ever worked in a warehouse, you can't get into the wash sink when it's quitting time. And you're trying to get to the time clock and people are bumping the time and they're in there before they should be and everybody's trying to get out of there. I go into the washroom and the whole bathroom's empty. It's quitting time. There's no one. I'm like, what in the world? I I checked my time and I went, no, it's quitting time. I scrubbed up, the door opens, a guy comes in, he walks to the two stalls, and he goes like this. Make sure there's no feet. I'm like, what are you looking for feet for? He crosses the sink from me, and he says, hey, so tell me what's going on. What's going on with your life? What happened to you? I said, what are you talking about? Oh, come on. You're so different. It's all everybody's talking about. Something happened to you, man. And they sent me in here. No, no, my co-workers. Four days saved. I didn't mention Jesus. I didn't hand out a track. They sent me in here and didn't want you distracted and hoping you'd talk to me openly like, we're all afraid. You didn't go holy roller on us, did you? And I said, I don't know anything about holy and rolling. But I'll tell you what, man. And I started to weep and it freaked him out. Because you don't cry in a warehouse. I started to weep and I said, over in that LB aisle on Sunday night, I met the true and living God. And he changed my life forever. And it's just the way it is. He said, oh, man. And they begin to try to counsel me out of my decision and tell me why I'm, why I'm going to come back to normal and why this is a phase and ask me if there's any traumatic things in my life right now that would cause me to... Because he said, my dad taught me my whole life that the only reason people go to God is because they're too weak to live. So they cling to God. They create a crutch to lean on because they can't get through life without that crutch. So it's all in their emotions. It's all fabricated. And he said, my dad taught me that from little up until he was dying of cancer. And I went in to see him and there was a Bible on his nightstand. He had been reading it and I was so mad at him. I grabbed it and said, what are you doing, dad? You taught me my whole life, none of this is real, and now you're going to wimp out because you're afraid of dying? That's rubbish. And he said, I threw the Bible in the garbage. That's how this guy's living. That's what he did to his daddy, who when you're facing death, you change some things, you start searching. So that's the guy I'm talking to. And I said, no. I said, honestly, he bore witness to my heart. He's real. My spirit's bearing witness, or his spirit to my spirit. He's, He's in me, and I'm his, and... 
I'm just telling you my life's never going to be the same. <laughs> and I said, and he kept, and I said, why are you trying, tell me one thing negative that you've seen in the four days that caused you to come in here. He said, well, it's not that it's negative. He said, well, for me, he said, you're so polite, it makes me sick. Because <laughs> he'd just assume me curse, because then he doesn't stand out. So if I blend in, we're all the same. You know what I did when I got saved? I knew I ate a lot of stuff. I worked in a food warehouse. Like if the power went out in a storm, we all ran to the seafood section. I'd crack a can of crab meat and never ate a can of crab meat so fast in my life I didn't even chew it. <laughs> like why? It's not that I didn't have money to go buy crab meat. You just, it's dark, power out. We, we knew how to make it to the seafood section in the dark. And then you eat the can of crab and the power comes on and you're all standing there. And everybody's got crab meat on their fingers and there's four cans open and we all stink. Like you can't even wash crab off. And then the boss is like, was anybody in the crab? No. <laughs> I did a little assessment in my heart for the time I worked there. I, I wrote a check for $700 and took it to the head guy of the plant before my shift. I asked if I could see him and I walked in and I repented and apologized for pilferaging, and that I haven't been an upright employee. And if you choose to terminate me, I would totally understand, but I can't live with this. I have to make peace, and this is restitution. I know this is probably a little more than I cost you, but I wrote the amount, and it was in the high hundreds of a check. And I said, I just want to make peace and say, I'm sorry I stole from the company that's employed me. But I can assure you now, if you choose to keep me on staff, I will work under God, and you will be glad that I'm on your team. And he wept, I didn't even know this, he wept and said, I'm a Christian, I've been praying for all you guys. He said, I am so excited to hear your testimony. I said, well, it was in the dairy box. God met me at work, in the dairy box. He came, called me out, I'll never be the same. He let me open up prayer time on Thursdays, on my day off, I'd go in and do a prayer time with the guys and we'd receive communion. I had 11 men in there that when they told me they went to church, not being rude, when they told me they went to church, I couldn't picture them in church. But yet they went because their wives wanted them to go. So I had 11 coworkers that came out of the woodwork and said, your life convicts me. I'm willing to admit I'm a Christian. I need more. And, and I sewed into them guys for a long time. And I worked there for two and a half years. Guys got saved, people got healed. More people got saved after I left because of the seeds that were sown. I'm bumping into people in public that are born again. They said, what well, was your life? I couldn't take it no more. I finally went to church. One guy had the most beautiful story. He said, I've been wanting to tell my wife. I was telling my wife, wanted to say, I want to go to church. Will you go with me? But I was afraid she'd laugh at me for wanting to go to church because she's always hard and and. And he said, finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. It was almost Easter. And I thought, I'm going to ask her to go to church on Easter. He said, honey, I got to ask you something. Please don't laugh at me or be hard on me. She said, what do you mean? Well, just don't make fun of me. It's something I've really been thinking of. And I've held off asking for the longest time. I was wishing you would go to church with me on Easter. She burst out crying and said, I've been wanting to ask you for months. And I thought you'd laugh at me. That's just how God's always working. I bumped into him going up the steps into a church, and I said, Butch, what are you doing? He said, I got saved, Dan. I looked one look into his face, and I could see he was saved. We cried on the steps. <sighs> Guys, none of this is happening because I'm trying to evangelize. None of this is happening because I'm under pressure to let the world know what I'm supposed to let them know. It's happening because I don't see myself as a sinner and I'm not trying not to sin. I've put on righteousness and I have access to God and he has access to me. And we're actually in fellowship and communion. Those little words that I heard last night, remember the little, just a little, just, they, just a little glimpse of what's available. It happens to me all the time. Why? I'm one with his heart. I'm one with him. It just brings God on the scene. You're sitting on the plane and you just know the person and you never met him. And then they're like, this is freaky. It's like, you know me. 
we've had people look, they think, they, they think it's a setup. Like, you know how, what are they, pranked? They think they're being pranked. Because you know details about their life and they think they're being set up. And somebody's filming their reaction. They're looking for a prank camera. I've seen that a handful of times. I'm like, no, this ain't no prank. Why is this stuff possible? And why am I telling you this? Because this is what we are created to live like. Because he said, follow me and the things I do, you'll do in greater things. But the sin thing gets in the way. First John, let's, let's try it. First John, chapter one. First John, epistles of John, chapter one, verse five. If you can find that, that would be amazing. And I don't want to put you on pressure, but if it pops up there, you guys tell me it popped up there. So what we have to do, and I'm going to show you in Romans six, we reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin. First Peter two says, he bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree. Why? That we having died to sin. Guys, we don't even believe that's possible in the church because we think it means perfection. No, it's dying to its mentality, its stain, its stigma, its memory, its regret. You're dying to everything it ever brought to our life which wasn't good. 1 Peter 2 says you should die to sin that you might live for righteousness. Watch. So when people keep talking about sin, they can't live for righteousness. And when you preach righteousness, they bring up our ability to sin so you can never put it on. Do you see the paradox? But scripture says, the reason he bore your sin, Tiffany, and my sin is so that we on a tree, and his body on a tree is so that you and me could die to sin. He's not just talking about the act. He's talking about the identity, the memory, the yucky, anything that has to do with it. We could die to it that we, you and I, might live right in the sight of God. Come on, that's scripture. There ain't nobody talking me out of that. This is the message we have heard. You can just roll with me. If you can, from him and declare to you that God is light. What is God? And in him is? Woo, no what? Okay. And God is light, and in him is no darkness, and where is he? He's in us, and you are the light of the world. Are you getting this? So if you were the enemy, wouldn't you confuse all this and our identity and get us tricked into doing all this stuff for God and never putting on what he paid for and who he sees us to be? And all of a sudden, you get reduced to doing things for God instead of living in him. Oh, come on, I'm on you. What's all? <laughs> oh, no darkness in him at all. <laughs> I had to replay the scripture. <laughs> That's an exclamation point. Okay, keep rolling with me. Did you take it off? Next verse, is this too hard? I mean, I don't want to put pressure on you, but you're doing great. That worked. If you can just roll with me and keep that up there. Whatever verse we were at, after all. Verse six. Yeah, yeah, no, I could, I could quote it, trust me. I just want to do it together. I want you guys to see it. And if it's, not going, if it's going to be hard, just tell me, man. I don't want you under pressure up there. We love you. There's no pressure. It either works or it doesn't. Some setups, some systems are so like, they, they're just so like, it's just they're set up that way and they put it on the, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, and I didn't know if you could just scroll verse after verse as I read. I thought I was hoping that could happen. If we say, thank you so much, if we say that we have fellowship, that means communion or relationship with God, and walk in darkness, come on, this is intense. Most people have the language, they're boasting in the darkness. They're saying, well, that's who we are. We're always going to do it. It's amazing. He loves us and considers us. That's how awesome our God is. Do you know that language is out there profusely? 
But if we walk in darkness, we're lying and we're not practicing the truth because you don't have fellowship and intimacy and relationship with him. You just have faith that he's God and you believe Jesus died on the cross and you have faith in certain theology, but you don't have fellowship with him. Because what he's saying is when you have fellowship with him, it's so life-changing that you're not going to walk in darkness if you're in communion with him because he's your conviction. All I'm doing is preaching scripture. Because if we say we have fellowship and communion and walk in darkness, guys, we're almost boasting in a weird way, thinking it's humility, boasting our ability to sin. And Tiffany and I are supposed to have died to sin so we can live in righteousness. And by his stripes, we are, see the connection, forgiveness, healing. There it is again, married. So if you were the devil, wouldn't you want to keep people sin conscious? Wouldn't you want to keep people from ever putting on righteousness? If the rulers and the kings of the earth knew what they were doing, they'd have never killed the son of God, but they did. So let's just make it 2,000 years later like it's no big deal. Just go to church, serve in the ministry, sit under the word, be encouraged. Life's still tough. Hey, we still got all our imperfections, but God still appreciates us. And one day this thing will be a wrap and we won't have to suffer no more. And we can just go to heaven. (laughs) That grieves the Holy Spirit. Promise. That's grievous. Okay. We lie and don't practice the truth. I just got there ahead of you. But if we walk in the light, somewhat like he's in the light, as close as humanly possible. Wow, this scripture, huh? Is this coming right out of a Bible? If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we actually have fellowship with See, because our consciences are clear. We've got nothing to hide. There's no secrets. There's no closets. Did you ever notice when somebody's struggling, when they feel guilty, when they cross the line and get something in their life, or they just did something that they know they shouldn't do, they get distant. They're hard to reach. They don't text you back. All of a sudden, you wonder where so-and-so is, and you usually find out they're struggling. Because when they're struggling, they go into hiding, and they don't have fellowship with one another. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we're going to have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from from most of our sins, some of our sins. So I've just been cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ from how much sin? So if I'm cleansed of all sin, is there any sin remaining? So should I see myself as a sinner or should I see myself as cleansed? Should I be guilty for yesterday, or should I live in the present and things to come and see it's a new day? Huh. Interesting. Next verse. And you are doing really good. I know this is different. But if we say, if we say we have no sin, now watch. He just talked about being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. True? True. What he's saying is, if you're saying you have no need for the blood, pay attention. You'll see that I'm not making this up. The scriptures will reveal it. What he's talking about is the power of righteousness and the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. If we say we have no sin, meaning if we don't have any need for the blood, what do you mean the blood of Jesus cleanses all sin? I don't even have any sin. What do I need cleansed from the blood for? Who knows we've all fallen short of the glory of God? Who knows we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Who knows we all come under that same thing where we need mercy and the blood of Jesus Christ? Okay, so if we say we have no need for that, well, then we're deceived and the truth isn't in us. He's not talking about if you say you have no sin. He's not talking about in the last hour. He can't be, because if you repented in the last hour, then you're clean, according to Scripture. So he can't be talking about if you have no sin, meaning recently. Oh, and other people say, I've heard this, people have confronted me with this. Dan, you don't understand, we're not walking in the level God lives in. We have sin all the time, we're just not aware of it and we're not sensitive. Because we are, well listen, he who knows to do right and doesn't, to him it is sin. So if I don't have any knowledge, there's no conviction, it'll never be sin. Until I grow into that knowledge. So as I grow in my relationship with Christ, I get more sensitive and I start putting off things that I thought were okay. And then I realize, whoa, wait a minute, I I don't need this. It's called maturing and growing up into him. 
Because if I'm going to stretch this thing analytically to the point that, look, I'm always guilty of sin, I'm sinning, and I don't even know it because I'm not sensitive, well, then you're just marking me always guilty of sin. The devil loves when people preach and believe that because you'll never wear righteousness and never be reckoned dead to sin, and you'll always think you're less than what he paid for. And then you won't have a clear conscience to have communion with him. The value of your own life won't be cool. You won't even think you're that important to God or his kingdom. And you know why that's a paradox? Because the two greatest commandments that tie up everything and you can hang all the law and all the prophets on these two things. Love God with everything you are, your heart, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, wonder if you don't like yourself. Well, then your neighbor's saying, please don't try to even fulfill that second one. Go get a revelation first. <laughs> because you know what the truth is? Most of us are loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, And that's why we're fault finding and nitpicky because that's how we do ourselves. And most of us aren't encouraged and we aren't encouraged by others. And most of us see what's wrong with people and what we'd love to change if we could just have five minutes alone in a room with them. Why? Because we have those own inconsistencies in our own heart and that's all we see with others because we love people the way we see ourselves. But if I see myself in Christ and I have a healthy identity and I see God loves me and now I love God and all of a sudden I'm looking at you and see what he sees about you, all of a sudden I'm loving you like I'm loving me. Come on, this is clear. Crystal clear. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to what? So the last verse, you were cleansed of all sins. Now you're, it's reaffirmed you're forgiven of your sins. And to clean, here we're getting cleansed again. Getting cleansed from what? All unrighteousness. Now watch. If I'm forgiven of all sin and cleansed of all sin and cleansed of all unrighteousness, what can only be left? Righteousness. So if I'm cleansed, I'm clean. If I'm not unrighteous, I'm righteous. Do you see the power of the blood and the gospel and the purpose of the cross? And then we, with our theological genius, judging ourselves by our own experiences, mess this whole beautiful thing up with a bunch of language that should never be on our lips. I'm going to prove it. No, I'm going to prove it. If we say that we have not sinned, okay, so back in verse 6, if we say we have no sin, what he's saying is we have no need for the blood, clarifies it in verse 8, if we say we have not sinned. What do you mean? I don't sin. I'm a good person. I break my neighbor's leaves and I don't cause trouble. Do you know how people talk like that? I'm a good person. I haven't sinned. If we say we have no need for the blood and we have not sinned, when all have fallen short of the glory of God because they've all sinned, well, then we're making him a liar. And his word isn't even in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Paul or John, you heretic. John, how can you go there? Come on, John, we all sin. We're not perfect, everybody sins. What are you saying? You're perfect? I know you're the disciple Jesus loved and all, but you're still a man, you're still human, and you still got that twisted nature in you. What are you doing right in this so we may not sin when that's impossible? He's talking about nature. He's talking about willfulness. He's talking about identity. He's talking about so you don't wake up and ever believe sin is who you are. I'm writing this so you see you're clean, you're cleansed, you're forgiven, and you're free. So you may not sin, may not. And if anyone and not when. And if anyone sins, don't throw in the towel. It's not the end of the world. Don't get condemned. Because your heart's sincere. You didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. See, that's what that other language does. It empowers people to keep living the same and feel like it's what we have to do because it's who we are. And then they can never put on Christ. 
then you might as well preach the gifts are all gone, there's no movement of the Holy Spirit, and healing's not for today. Where does it end? And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. (laughs) Jesus Christ, the righteous. So guess what I put on? Him. Guess what that makes me? My heart's so convicted by that, I'm not trying to sin. I don't even want to sin. I want to live here with the Father. And he himself is the propitiation or the mercy seat or the mercy for our sins. And watch this. And not for ours only. And this is where people make mistake and say everybody's going to heaven, everybody's saved. No, no, you have to repent. You have to change your mind. You have to get transferred. You have to get new life from the inside of you. You have to repent. Watch. Not ours only, but also for the whole world. This is why an unbeliever can be healed on the streets because of that mercy triumphing over judgment. Are you with me? Oh, it's so clear. It's all in your Bible. Uh, oh, man, I got time for now. Hebrews 10. Can I stretch you? It's good I can't see your faces. So good I can't see your faces. Hebrews 10, verse 1. Can we just go to Hebrews 10 quick? Can we do the same thing and scroll like that? That would be incredible if we can do that. So are you guys getting some out of this? Did you see that? I read that in context. Because most preachers will pull that out of context. Well, if we say we have no sin, we're deceived. We make him a liar, we're deceived. Truth isn't in us. And they pull scripture out of context instead of read it in text for what it's actually saying. Because in verse one, he said, little children, I'm writing this to you. He didn't say sinners by nature. He said, little children, family of God, God's kids. I'm writing this to you so you may not sin. What he's saying is, so that the power of righteousness could rest on you and you understand you're cleansed, you put on a new identity and it actually empowers you to live different. He's not even talking perfection. He's talking about not being overcome by the flesh and actually living by the spirit. So you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You know what 2 Peter 1 says? You have exceedingly great and precious promises by which through them you partake of his divine nature. Having escaped out of darkness into the light, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Look up the word, self-centered, unsatisfiable desire. I've died to myself. I've denied myself. I've loved not my life unto death. I've lost my life to find my life. I've come out of darkness into the light. I've received the divine nature and I've escaped the corruption that used to own me, living for me. It's scriptural. I got so much word on this. For the law having a shadow, just a shadow of things, good things to come, but not the very image of those things can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then, wouldn't they have ceased to have been offered? Can you tell I've read my Bible? What he's talking about is in the old days when they go once a year and the priest would go into the temple and then they go behind the curtain to the Holy of Holies and, and they'd, they'd take blood in there, but it was blood of bulls and stuff and not the blood of Jesus. So it says this, this thing was just a shadow of the good thing to come. So when they did this every year, went through this, it wasn't the thing. It was just a shadow of the good thing to come because if the worshipers once purified, if they'd have been purified, it's, or, or if the worshipers were cleansed, then, then there'd have been no more, if it was sufficient, there'd have been no more year after year offering. In other words, it would have been once for all, and you get this identity, right? So watch, back up, back up a second. Wouldn't it have ceased being offered? Would not the worshipers once purified, okay, the worshipers once Purified. Once they were purified, look at the effect of being purified. They would have had no more. Ah, it's so scripture. It's everywhere in your Bible. And leaders and teachers and scholars pluck 
plaque after plaque after plaque. Fight this tooth and nail to keep you sin conscious and call it humility. Well, you've never been to Bible school. I've read my Bible. I don't want your school if you're teaching that. That is not a riddle. That is not a parable. I do not need an education to read that and understand, Joe. Look, I know it sounds like I'm venting. I am a little because there's a lie out there. He's robbing people of what he paid for. The worshipers once purified. Did I show you in 1 John that you're cleansed of all sin? That you're cleansed of all unrighteousness? Would you call that purified? Then you should have no more That's a goal of the gospel. A goal of the cross is to take the consciousness of sin, the identity of sin, off of the believer so he can actually wear what God made for him, a robe called righteous. And that become who he is, his identity. And if he believes his righteous, he'll produce the fruit of righteousness. And you know them by their fruit. We're trees of righteousness the planning of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Why? Because the fruit of righteousness is any manifestation of who he is, his nature, and his person. So righteousness empowers me to manifest him, which is the fruit of righteousness. If you don't believe you're that righteous tree, you'll try to produce the fruit. And you'll be sure you're failing or you'll try to sell your fruit instead of bear it so people can pick it. Yeah, Ooh, I'm preaching in this church. The worshipers once purified the goal, what would they have? No more consciousness of sin. Yeah, but we're always going to sin and nobody's perfect. And why are you even bothering preaching that, brother? Because everybody's sinning and you probably sinned already this morning. And if you say you didn't, you're a liar. People talk like that in leadership. If they're talking like that, it's because they're living like that. And they have no conviction to change except to confront your preaching because it would challenge their life. Come on, if you're preaching that, it's because you're living it. Yeah. Well, brother, everybody has their stuff. So what's your stuff? Like I had a pastor, I left his church first night. He invited me in. Maybe he didn't know what was coming. <laughs> he's taking me back to his house and he's quiet. And I said, are you okay? I didn't go too long or anything. No, it's just some of the things you said I'm struggling with. I said, okay, well, let's talk about it. Well, you can't go around saying you don't have any closets. And there's always things in people's lives that people don't know. Everybody has secrets. I said, wow, you're concerning me, pastor. Pastoring people with secrets, that means you have secrets. What's your secret? And it was pornography. But the reason he couldn't hear the word is because he believed in his heart. Everybody has their secret stuff. So when I preached I don't have closets or secret stuff, he couldn't relate to that, so he confronted that, hoping that would change me so he didn't have to be confronted. A long story short, he ended up sitting on the bed. He was letting me sleep in and sobbing like a baby, and each night he tapped on my door and said, can we talk? And we spent a lot of good hours together. Another man said, I can't listen to you preach anymore because I feel condemned. Oh, So where's the sin in your life? Because everything I'm sharing is life-giving. It's not condemning. There's unconfessed sin in your life. There's things you violate your conscience in. Come on, where's the sin in your life? Well known. If I spoke his name, everybody would know his name. People are looking for prayer from him. Don't try to think who it is. You'll never guess. I'm just telling you, people of esteem in the eyes of the... They're living this stuff and believing wrong things. And this man, too, totally bound in pornography, watching videos as he's leading so-called the country in Christ. Said he can't listen to me preach because it convicts him or condemns him. That's a sign 
that he's already condemned in his own conscience. Isn't that something? You think I'm going to back off? I'm on to something. We're going to root this thing out and get it to the point where a man's heart is exposed. You either want him or you don't. You're either dealing with things or you're ignoring things. But nobody's going to be like, I didn't know. Wish somebody had told me. Uh Uh-huh. But in the old sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin. Every year, just a reminder of sin. For it is not possible, which means it is possible through Jesus, because he's talking about the former, the shadow. So if it is not possible with this, then it is possible with Jesus. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. But Jesus was announced the Lamb of God who... Oh, it's so scriptural. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you've prepared for me. Uh Uh-oh, he came as a man. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure in them. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of this book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are all offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first and establishes the second. Y'all getting this? By this will, the second. Oh, my goodness, back up a minute. By this will, the second one, we have been sanctified, set apart with a holy calling through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest is still standing, ministering, and daily offering repeatedly these things, and it can never take away sins. But this man, but this man, Do you see why we do this? But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, whoa, sounds like I better put it on and never take it off. One sacrifice forever sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time, waiting till all his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever. When nobody's perfect, he has perfected. When nobody's perfect, he has perfected forever. Those who are being set apart. Do you know the truth? Not a lot of Christians are thinking about being set apart. They're thinking about going to heaven and going to church. He's talking about being set apart in the world, not of the world, and transformed by the renewing of your mind and walking in the light as he's walking in the light. Do you hear there's a different message coming from him than the average mentality of the preachers and the people that are attending church? Ain't that something? He perfected what? Forever those who are being set apart. So if you're surrendering and you're growing in God and you're coming to God and you're in communion with God and you're asking him and you're putting off and putting on and keep molding me and shaping me and let my eyes see what you see. And when you go in prayer, don't troubleshoot. Don't go for what's wrong with you. Go for what's made right. Go for what he's called you to. Don't go into a prayer closet and say, Father, I wish you'd do something with this old stinky, wretched heart. If you don't do something with this heart, I don't know what I'm gonna do because my heart stinks. God, you gotta fix my heart. Don't do that. Father, I thank you. You got my attention. You're convicting me and you're doing a work in my heart. God, I thank you that you're making my heart one with you, that you're causing me to look through your eyes and live by your spirit. God, you have more than my attention. You have my life, and I yield my... If you start getting alone with God and talking like that and stop just praying your list of needy things, you'd be amazed how your life would transform, how you'll see him different, you'll see you different, and then you'll see people different. Yeah? But this sin thing keeps people from living there because they don't feel worthy, they feel guilty, they feel ashamed. Guilt, condemnation, shame, three major tools of the devil. He uses them all the time because they work. 
If I did a show of hands and you were honest, and I'd say, how many of you for a season or a time in your life since you've been a Christian went through seasons of guilt, condemnation, or shame? Almost everybody in the room would raise their hand, and I'm saying you should never be able to raise your hand because he did not come to condemn the world. It's never his arena. He doesn't work in that field, and he doesn't subcontract the devil to use those tools. Guilt is a subconscious confession that you're not forgiven. Condemnation is a subconscious confession that your life is worthy to be judged. Shame is a subconscious confession that it's what I'm ashamed of is still who I am. All three are anti-finished works of Christ. All three are the opposite of what the cross accomplished. Guilt, condemnation, shame should never, ever be in a Christian. True, sincere conviction, running to him, putting on Christ, repentance, putting off, putting on is where we live. It's not guilt, con- regret is the world's way of handling things. And the Bible in 2 Corinthians 7 said it leads to death. Regret leads to death. But godly sorrow leads to the change of heart and life understanding and looking through the kingdom, not just you. Why'd I have to go there? Man, if I wouldn't, if I'd have just turned left, why? If I'd have just turned left, it would have never happened. That's regret, produces death. There's no freedom there. Come on, I'm giving you examples. Whoo, I got 31 minutes. Am I showing you good scriptures? Can we do Romans 6 and just put the cherry on the top and just go home excited? Like, I'm excited. I mean, I got born again three times. I got three baptisms coming. You know what? I'm giving you how much scripture. Can you tell that I don't just share my opinions? Everything that comes out of my mouth is wrapped in scriptures. It's just pouring out of me. You, I, I'm not in memorization. I never tried to memorize my Bible in my life. But it seems like I can really rip it off. It comes to me when I need it. It's downloaded in the files of my heart, and I'm in communion and fellowship with God. Yo. Yeah. You get it? And be honest, I'm not talking riddles. You can't not hear what I'm saying because it's right here. I asked the Lord a long time ago, if I'm going to stand in front of people and preach, would you do one thing for me, please? This was a prayer request. I said, would you make it that when I'm finished, a man only has one of two responses? He says, why would you say one of two? Why not one? Because we're not robots. He wants relationship, not service. He wants friends, not slaves. One of two. That Tiffany would sit there and say, wow, I hear what he's saying and I want it. Or wow, I hear what he's saying, I'm just not there and I don't really want it. But that she would never leave and go, what's he trying to say? And I don't believe anybody's leaving here going, what's he trying to say? It locates your heart, it locates your want to, it locates if all you want to do is argue or if you really want to listen and consider the word. Because I didn't give you my opinion one time today. Let's go to Romans 6 and see what it says. The reason he starts off with this question is because at the end of Romans 5, and it's all one letter, you have to understand when it was translated, we broke it up into chapters, but it's actually one big long letter, unbroken letter. So what he said was, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. In the end of 5, right? Who knows that we quote that, and that's a cool thing. Where sin abounded... God didn't cut you off. Grace came all the greater, not to accommodate sin or to wink at sin or make light of sin, but to actually crush it and get you out of it, right? So grace came greater. God's ability came greater. Where sin was abounding, grace came greater. So Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Question mark. Certainly not. Emphatic. Certainly not. Now watch. This is what most people have never been taught because they prayed a prayer to go to heaven and they're Christians for well-being and they actually don't even realize that they're Christians for their own sake, not him. That's why there's discouraged Christians everywhere. Certainly not. How shall we who... See, I don't know many people that even understand that that can tell me they died to sin because everybody keeps saying, but we always sin. We're never perfect. Everybody sins. 
Well, what are you saying, Dan? You don't sin, you're perfect, you're, you're freaking me out. No, you're not even listening to scripture. I'm talking about identity. I'm not even talking about the act of sin. I'm talking about just identity, identifying with sin. How shall we who what? Died to sin. Well, not only did nobody tell us maybe that we could die to sin, that it was even possible. But scripture says it. You can go to your whole life, you can go to church, and nobody will teach you this. And I'm not saying here. I'm saying just church. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in its practice is what that means. Wow. Or do you not know? No, some of us don't know. That's why we teach. Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Oh, I was right. Therefore... We were buried with him through baptism into death. So there's twice he said we're buried into his death. What's that mean? You'll see in a minute. That just as Christ was raised, so it's not just about dying, it's about raising, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Woo! So it sounds like there's no living unless there's dying. So I better understand that when I come to Christ, I'm denying myself and die into the identity, stain, memory, and whatever of sin, and putting that off, and I'm putting him on. I'm dying to sin, because how can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Do you understand that when you leave on its identity, it permits its actions? So now we have to come up with theology that compensates for that and paints a picture of grace and mercy in a way that God winks at it and understands our dilemma. Thank God he still loves us and forgives us and we're still gonna go to heaven. That is not relationship with God. That is misdefining him and doing yourself grave injustice. We have newness of life, people. Not forgiveness of life, newness of life. I mean, we are forgiven. But you have new life, not just forgiven life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, that's the third time he said that in two sentences, certainly we also shall be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, second time you better know, that our old man was crucified with him. Not is being crucified, was crucified. When he died, I died. Why? That the body of sin might be done. Yeah, but brother, stop. We're always going to sin. Everybody sins. Nobody's perfect. What are you trying to say? You're perfect? You don't sin? Come on, we all sin. That's the language out there. It's a devil. It's it's misunderstanding scripture. I'm telling you, it's demon-inspired. Because it's anti-finished work of Christ and it's making you never put on righteousness and that's what makes you reign. Yeah. Selah for sure. But the body of sin might be, well, that's impossible. Paul, why are you even writing this stuff, Paul? You should know better. Jesus teaches you himself. Hello? Who taught Paul? So he didn't have seminary? He went off for 14 years in Asia somewhere and hung out with the Lord and came back with this? Paul, you were listening to some evil spirit. That's what people would think. Who did Paul learn from? Jesus himself. And he's writing this. And we fight it tooth and nail. That the body of sin might what? Be what? Is that in your Bible or my sermon? It's in my sermon because it's in your Bible. That we should no longer, no longer be a slave to sin. But yeah, but brother, stop. We're always going to sin. Everybody sins. We all sin. We probably sinned this morning. What, you're saying you don't sin? You never sin? You're freaking me out. We all sin. And we have been so 
mesmerized by that language that we think it's right and we think it's humility. It's wrong identity. That's what makes you a slave. For he who, uh uh-oh, here's the thing. He who has died, not he who has prayed a prayer to go to heaven. He who has died, uh uh-oh, now we're on to something. He who has actually died, he's not a Christian for himself. He's a Christian for God's glory. He's a Christian for God's great name. He's actually a Christian for the sake of others. He's not a Christian for him. He's a Christian for God's glory. He died to everything he's ever been so that everything God is can live in him. This man that died, guess what he is? This guy that's died, guess what he's been freed from? No, this is in your Bible. What's he been freed from? What? Oh, come on, you bunch of blasphemers. How can you be free from sin when you're always going to sin and everybody sins and you all sin and you probably all sin yet today and you're probably sinning now for just saying what you said? I'm being graphic for a reason. I want it to sound so silly what we've got trapped in that we never live there again. And if people choose to, fine, but make sure it's not you. He who has died has been what? Well, it's possible to be free from sin because we always commit it. Verse 8, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. See, most of the people that have this language don't even believe that. They don't believe in communion with God, life in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe anything's alive yet today. Think the last gifts fell off the earth when the apostle, last apostle died. Knowing, fourth time, or third, fourth time, you better know, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no longer any dominion over him. Now, verse 10 is going to explain to you, remember how we were buried in baptism into his death? This is what you were baptized into, and this is what you were made one with and buried. Baptism means to be fully immersed, dipped into, fully immersed, and made one with. So to be baptized into his death, here's what his death is. For the death that he died, uh uh-oh, he died to, this is what you're getting immersed in one with and baptized into. Oh man, am I a good preacher today. I am preaching really good in your church. The death he died, he died to sin once for, but the life that he lives, He lives to God because we're baptized and made one with and buried into it. Likewise, you, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not Let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. For do you not know that you present your members, you're that one slave or an instrument of, uh, to obey, whether instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. In other words, don't present yourself as an instrument of unrighteousness or you'll just produce sin. You present yourself as from God, alive from the dead. Do you see? It's all about identity. It's waking up, not trying to not sin or trying not to sin. It's waking up, enjoying being his. And you, your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That doesn't sound like guilt, doesn't sound like shame, doesn't sound like condemnation. That sounds like faith in the finished work of Christ. That sounds like God single-handedly sent his son and took care of my dilemma and changed the wretched man that I am. Do you know some of these teachers that attack this stuff are saying Romans 7 in the middle of 6 and 8 is Romans 7 is Paul being honest and coming out with the blight of his life where he never does the things he wants and doesn't do. That's hypocrisy. Paul wouldn't even have the authority to write the things he's writing if that was his real life. He's talking about his life under the law before Christ. How can you say that Paul was struggling with sin after he's writing Chapter 6, 
Oh, my goodness. This is why, and I know this could be, sound self-righteous to you, but this is why God said, don't let many of you be teachers. A lot of people want to be teachers because it makes them feel like somebody's standing in front of people. I know in my heart, I've never, ever asked to be a teacher. I've just lived Christ and people ask me to talk about it. And then when you do, you got a million teachers around. And he said, don't let many of you be teachers. There's a stricter judgment. You better make sure your motive is right in teaching or you will never see clear. And if you could read your Bible to be right, you'll probably be wrong. If you read your Bible to defend something you've been taught, you'll probably think you found it. If you read your Bible to find a way out of your marriage, you're sure you found the scriptures. The eye you look through is what you see. For sin shall have no dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under the law. You're under grace. So Paul goes right back to the beginning of the chapter. What then? Shall we just go ahead and sin? Just continue in its identity and its stain and its sting? Because we're under the grace and not the law? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself as a slave? Wouldn't you agree that when people say, well, we're always going to sin. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's going to sin. We got this dilemma until the day we die. We're always just going to have this part in us. Do you understand that you're submitting to that as your master? You're making yourself a slave to that identity and presenting yourself as a minister or a member of unrighteousness? And who you present yourself as a slave to, obey, you are that one slave whom you obey. So you will manifest what you believe. This is not hard, this is simple. Whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were a slave of sin, though you were a slave to sin, you've obeyed from the heart this form of doctrine in which you've heard. Go ahead. And having been, oh my goodness, he's saying it again, he's so bold. And having been what? No, no, that sounds like heresy to me. <laughs> having been set free from sin, ah, and you've become a slave. Now, I looked up the word slave. You know what it means? Bound and chained to do one's will. So if you're a slave of sin, you're bound and chained to do the will of sin. But if you're a slave to God, you're bound and chained to do his will. If you're bound to righteousness and you're a slave to righteousness, you're bound and chained to do the will of righteousness. You become a slave of righteousness. I speak in human terms. No, it's okay. I speak in human terms because of the Weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented and used to see yourself, right? Not this way, but a slave of uncleanness and, and of lawlessness leading to what? More lawlessness because the fruit and the tree thing. So when you saw yourself that way and presented yourself that way, it led to more that way. But now... You present yourself as members of righteousness for what? Holiness. For when you were a slave and bound and chained to do the will of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. And what fruit, come on people, what fruit did you have when you were living that way? Of which things you are now ashamed, meaning you wish you never did them. For the end of those things is death. But now having been, now having been set free from sin and having become chained and bound to God to do his will, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ah, I don't know how it could get any clearer and how it could get any better. Don't you live another day buying into that thing out there. I gave you not just one or two sections of scripture. 
I feel like I gave you the Bible. <laughs> like I gave you a whole lot of scripture. And here's where we make the mistake. He's not even talking about the act of sin. He's talking about the identity. And when you let the identity change, you see the act will get affected by the identity change. And you won't see, you, you'll see that you're not at the mercy of sin like people speak. You're subject to grace and God's power and God's ability because righteousness produces its fruit. That's not something you worked for. That's not something you earned. That's not something you bit your lip to accomplish. That's something you see and believe and righteousness produces its fruit. All fruit comes out of being holiness. It's not because you're trying to be holy. It's because you believe you've been made clean and your life starts to be clean. Your heart's clean. Your will and desires are clean. And all of a sudden you have this new thing in you called new life, a new creation. You get it? Don't ever relate to who you were and bring the old into the new. Unless you make the wine skin new, the new wine can never be contained in the old identity. It's all scriptural. I've given you way more than ample scripture to be in fellowship with God and be in community. Know this, and when you have this relationship and you believe he loves you, when I pastored full-time, 90-some percent of people I interviewed and asked questions never initiated the love of God or acknowledged his love for them on their own apart from a corporate worship service or a song, never just walking through their house. Father, thanks for loving me. Father, I so appreciate your love for me. Thank you that you value me and that you wash me clean. I'm so glad I'm yours. I found that 90-some percent of Christians never talked like that to God, but most all of them did daily devotions and had an intellectual relationship through the knowledge of God's word instead of an intimate relationship for a communion and a fellowship with God himself. Just going in the bathroom, getting ready for work. Father, thank you for a new day, for life in you. Holy Spirit, I welcome you and appreciate you in me. You're my wisdom today. Man, thank you. You've turned my heart towards my coworkers. Man, I used to be angry at Fred, and now I have so much compassion. God, I believe you're doing an amazing work in Fred. God, thank you for today, just full of grace and excitement and maybe even surprises, but all good in God. I am so excited to be alive in you. That sure beats God. Would you please help me get through the day? If you knew my schedule, right? You'd know it, right? Like, <laughs> and I mean, I don't even know how I'm going to make it to lunch if you don't intervene. God, you really need to pitch in here and help me today. And then we call that prayer. And that's just a self-centered whirlwind and you'll never shine as a light. Most of our prayers are self-consumed, self-concerning, concerning, and it's just God getting us through instead of God empowering us to live Christ. You with me? Could you stand to your feet with me? I'm just going to pray over you as a house. So I got, man, I got nine minutes left and 50 seconds. It's because they gave me half a day. <laughs> they gave me like half a day. He said, here, man, you can have all morning. Clock won't be your enemy. I just ask you to stand just to activate your heart and your body and get up. And Who saw what the Bible's saying? Who saw what God's saying today? The greatest thing you can do is put on righteousness and see yourself apart from sin. We're not saying anybody's perfect, but we've been made perfect. So we're talking about purity and the pure in heart shall see God and the effect of righteousness will so affect my life that I'll be living in a place of grace that I didn't even realize was possible and the things I thought I had to be subject to, I'll have total dominion over because of him. And I won't stumble into things like I used to and my desires will change and even the way I look and see my wife had changed. Do you see what I'm saying? Why? Because I put on Christ, and when I put on Christ, it's because I took off me. And I'm no longer just a sinner that's saved or forgiven. I'm his son 
the righteousness of God in Christ, and we have a like faith and a unity in that faith because of, 2 Peter 1, the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Okay, now this doesn't make you charismatic. If you're Baptist in here today, you can do this, and nobody's going to take a picture and put it on Facebook and say you've converted to the Pentecostals. I wish we didn't even have all those names. I was, the pastor came to me real heated one day, and he asked me a challenging question. He, it was a challenge. He was challenging my belief. And he asked me, and I just answered him point blank and said, absolutely, yes, I believe that. That's what I hate. It's a strong word. That's what I hate about you charismatic Pentecostals. And he just accosted me with words. And I wept and said, is that what I am to you? Charismatic and Pentecostal? I don't even know that's what I am. I just know Jesus came and changed my life. I've been with him and I read my Bible. And you've judged me a certain way because you have me in a box. But you don't know me. You've never hung with me. You didn't even get a chance to hear my heart. You never saw my tears. You've never heard me pray. You've never saw me in my bedroom. God forbid you rob yourself of who I am in call me a charismatic and Pentecostal. I don't even know what that is. Yeah? Yeah. What I'm asking you to do, and you're not going to become an instant charismatic Pentecostal, <laughs> would you just lift your hands to heaven with me? It's just something David talked about, lifting holy hands. It's a sign of yielding, humility, surrender. Some people get intimate and say, it's like a child saying, pick me up, Papa. It, but right now, I just want you to see it as a sign of just surrender, humility. Yes, Lord, I'm all in. I'm, I'm posturing myself towards you. I'm reaching holy hands towards you because you made them holy. Right? Like who can enter that holy place of God? He with clean hands and a pure heart. Like his hands and heart are clean. So if the blood of Jesus wouldn't have done that, then how could we ever enter in? So just lift holy hands to him today. And from your heart, you thank him that you're clean. You thank him that you're absolutely forgiven of everything you've ever done. You thank him that he sees you worthy and righteous and holy in his sight. Come on, if you'd have low esteem, if you've had a, a bad identity yourself, you gotta stop that. You didn't learn that from the cross. You learned that from past experience or the impression of others. But you sure didn't learn it from this message. So out of your heart, it might be good to just verbalize it and say, Father, thank you that you love me. Thank you that I'm clean, that you washed me, and you set me free. God, I thank you you're doing a work in my heart. You're doing a work that'll show up in my life. I'm not under pressure. I am so privileged to be yours. I'm not risking failing. I'm enjoying becoming. And if anything I see in my life after today is less than what you called me to, I will run to you and never from you. I trust you. You gave your life for me, Jesus. You gave your word to me. I'm going to live it and believe it. Help me understand it more. But with my hands raised, I'm saying, I'm yours. Have your way in me. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to mark every heart, bring these words to remembrance, and manifest Christ in our lives for the sake of the whole. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Okay, you coming up? Woohoo! Thanks, guys, for your patience. Whoa, I don't even feel like I need to eat lunch. I just need to like go process with the Lord what I, the spiritual buffet I got to dine on all morning with with Dan. Thank you so much. Well, friends, just a couple announcements. Um, we're going to break for a couple hours, so please plan on being back a little before two o'clock. That's when our next sessions will begin. Um, also, we're asking that you please take your valuables. You may still like save your seat, but this will not be a locked auditorium. So we just want to be mindful of your phones and purses, wallets, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I would just boldly encourage you um, 
to let the Holy Spirit continue even over lunch. Uh, if you're going to lunch with somebody, just start processing and digesting what, what God is speaking to you and, and what that means for you. And I mean, be bold and courageous too. If, if you feel the Holy Spirit highlight someone to you that you can pray for, don't shrink back. Let's just go for it and have a testimony to share by the time this afternoon session gets kicked off. We love you so much. Thank you. We'll see you in a couple hours.